Hello, and thank you for watching this session for newly open free schools. My name is Hannah Jackson, and I'm the head of school programs here at New Schools Network. We're incredibly grateful to Sir David Carter today for giving this presentation on the importance of leadership. Sir David Carter was the National Schools Commissioner from 2016 to 2018, and previously served as the first Regional Schools Commissioner for the South West. He's currently the Director of System Leadership at Ambition Institute. If you have any questions for us following this session or would like to find out more about the support that New Schools Network offers for open free schools, please get in touch with us at helpdesk at newschoolsnetwork.org and I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, for that very warm introduction uh, and good afternoon or good morning or good evening to, uh, to whoever you are and who, where, where you're watching this from. Um, it's, it's a real honour for me to have the opportunity to work with you uh, and to recognise the important work that you're doing uh, within within the free school world. And so the very broad title uh, of what I wanted to share with you uh, in this session is around the importance of leadership, um, which is a, which is a clearly a, a, a very obvious statement, but I thought I'd try to ground it in what you'll see on the next slide, which is which is a quote, which I think is a fabulous one. And the next slide talks about um, the standards you walk past are the standards you accept. Uh, and I came across uh, I came across this quote for the first time probably about five or six years ago, um, and and the origin of it, which I'll share with you in a moment, uh, is not from education. It's from it's from a very very different context, but it resonated for me because it felt it was so relevant to what school leadership is about. The standards you walk past are the standards you accept, and it, and it's how we address I think one of the really big priorities when we're leading our schools, which is the consistency of leadership decision making and the leadership behaviours. You know, for example, why is it that a child who's walking down the corridor, perhaps in a pair of training shoes, which are inappropriate for your school uniform policy, and that three adults walk past them and ignore it, but you're the fourth adult that picks it up and, and, and addresses it? Why, why should that be the case? So the standards you walk past are the standards you accept is, I think, a really useful quote. And on the next slide, um, I'll, I'll show you where it's come from. So the quote uh, is attributed to Lieutenant General David Morrison. Um, and it was in a speech that he gave to camera on the 13th of June in 2013. And he was talking um, to the Australian Army following the announcement of civilian police and defence investigations into allegations of unacceptable behaviour and conduct by army members. And he uses this phrase in that. And I just thought to open this session uh, this, the, the, this afternoon, this evening, in the morning, whenever you're looking at it, I would just share the clip of him doing this speech. So on the next slide, just take a couple of minutes to watch this video with me. Earlier today, I addressed the media and through them the Australian public about ongoing investigations into a group of officers and NCOs whose conduct, if proven, has not only brought the Australian Army into disrepute, but has let down every one of you and all of those whose past service has won the respect of our nation. There are limits to how much I can tell you because the investigations into this network by both the New South Wales Police and the ADF Investigative Service are ongoing. But evidence collected to date has identified a group of men within our ranks who have allegedly produced highly inappropriate material, demeaning women, and distributed it across the internet and Defence's email networks. If this is true, then the actions of these members are in direct contravention to every value the Australian Army stands for. By now, I assume you know my attitude to this type of conduct. I have stated categorically many times that the Army has to be an inclusive organisation in which every soldier, man and woman, is able to reach their full potential and is encouraged to do so. Those who think that it is okay to behave in a way that demeans or exploits their colleagues have no place in this army. Our service has been engaged in continuous operations since 1999 and in its longest war ever in Afghanistan. On all operations, female soldiers and officers have proven themselves worthy of the best traditions of the Australian Army. They are vital to us maintaining our capability now and into the future. If that does not suit you, then get out. You may find another employer where your attitude and behaviour is acceptable, but I doubt it. 
The same goes for those who think that toughness is built on humiliating others. Every one of us is responsible for the culture and reputation of our army and the environment in which we work. If you become aware of any individual degrading another, then show moral courage and take a stand against it. No one has ever explained to me how the exploitation or degradation of others enhances capability or honours the traditions of the Australian Army. I will be ruthless in ridding the army of people who cannot live up to its values, and I need every one of you to support me in achieving this. The standard you walk past is the standard you accept. That goes for all of us, but especially those who by their rank have a leadership role. If we are a great national institution, if we care about the legacy left to us by those who have served before us, if we care about the legacy we leave to those who, in turn, will protect and secure Australia, then it is up to us to make a difference. If you're not up to it, find something else to do with your life. There is no place for you amongst this band of brothers and sisters. So that is clearly a really powerful clip, um, making, making a very clear point about the values that, uh, that the general believes so passionately in. And it got me thinking about how we translate that into a message about how we lead in our school system. And I think this quote here, this question I've posed to you here, really I think summarizes uh, the challenge really well. How do you remain loyal to your values, but deliver the right messages at the same time. Now, in many ways, there is no contradiction between what we believe in, what our values are, and the behaviours that we, what we exhibit them. But that's easier to say when we're talking about that individually. When we're talking about the collective might of our workforce, all of the people who work with children on our behalf as leaders every day, this is the challenge that we have to be able to meet. How we remain loyal to our values, yet deliver the right messages at the same time. So if I move on to my next slide, uh, I thought I'd begin by sharing with you what I see as some of the things which I believe underpin the leadership landscape today and, and fundamentally give us the opportunity to think about how do we deliver ethical leadership um, so that that statement about the standards that you just heard me talk about is, is a really live issue for us. So I think the six things that leaders need to be good at include these things here. Ethical leadership in a collaborative context. Um, ethical leadership um, around the quality of decision making, the relationship between the values that we have, the beliefs we have about how we should behave and how we should build culture, but also thinking about how we do that within the context of working with others, that collaborative element that is so important to, to leadership in our schools today. The second one is about how we lead and embed those culture and values. So yes, we need to articulate them. Yes, we need to talk about them and share them, but we also have to find a, a way of giving them meaning and, and enabling that that thinking and that belief to be embedded in the way that we work and we see it through the way that we lead people the way that we lead collaborations the way that we lead school improvement and in particular the legacy that we build as we prepare future leaders that we work with how we model to others the leadership behaviors that we believe are going to be so integral to the success of our schools so let me go into this in a bit more depth and try and unpick this on the next slide and what you have here is what I describe as the multiple intelligences that enable leaders to be effective. Um, and I absolutely recognise that there is uh, a, a whole more complex way of describing this than the way I'm about to do it. But I, I think for this, for this presentation, I think this will, this will make the point I want to make. So I believe that there are two fundamental intelligences to the way that school leadership is seen at its very best. And on the left hand side of the screen, you see what I've called operational intelligence. And what I mean by operational intelligence is the way that my leadership impacts upon change management. How do I know what to do? How do I know when to do it? How do I gather together enough people with me who have experience of building the strategy that I now need, whether it's around improving teaching, improving behavior, thinking about how we get better attendance, all of those things that are the real nuts and bolts and the technical aspect of how we improve our schools I think we can call operational intelligence the right hand side of the slide talks about emotional intelligence and people like Daniel Goleman have written a great deal about this uh, and you'll be very familiar I'm sure with some of his work but the challenge here is how my leadership impacts upon other people how do I make sense of the change that I'm leading as a head 
How do I describe the role that I need everybody to play? How do I explain how I want people to perhaps to behave slightly differently in the way that we're working? And then that's where we get this kind of transactional leadership uh, arrangement between the two. Um, and Amy Edmondson, again, another author who you may be very familiar with, with um, talks a great deal in many of her articles, her books and her Harvard Business Review articles about psychological safety. And that for me is what binds these two things together. So in that intersect between operational intelligence and emotional intelligence is where leaders build the culture of the organization where it is safe and secure to challenge, to talk about whether or not we can influence this change. What do we think about that change and how do we input the views of the collective into what it is that we're trying to do? And I think all of those things are wrapped up in this theory that I've got in my mind about how do we build really intelligent leadership systems. Now I want to take that one stage further on the next slide and try to deepen that. Um, and what you hear, you have here is what I call um, a leadership pyramid. Um, and the pyramid has got children at the heart of it, as you'd expect. And the three corners of the py pyramid talk about the workforce, the people that we employ to deliver great outcomes to young people, the parents and carers that we have um, our closest relationship with, we, we educate them, look after their children. And then in the bottom right hand corner, the, the community. And when I use the word community, I'm talking about this at multiple layers. So absolutely, I mean the community that you serve, the community that surrounds both geographically um, and, and culturally and emotionally the school that you lead. But I'm also talking about the wider educational community, where we get our ideas from, where we get our challenge from, the research and the evidence that we use to try to inform our own thinking. And around that pyramid, I think there are four blocks which talk about what really powerful leadership does to create the cultures that create impact. So in the top left hand corner, you see I've written where the leader influences. Uh, and that's a really important part of it, because what the leader does is they set the tone for the way that a school operates on a day to day basis. Leaders in many ways shape the weather that, that affects the school, the kind of climate in which we work and the way that people operate together. So that influential role is incredibly important. Um, and it's something which is embedded in every one of us who has this responsibility. In the bottom left hand corner, you see I've written where the leader builds engagement. Um, and, I, and I probably mean followership when I say that. The two signs of the sides of the leadership coin are leadership and followership. There are lots of people who lead um, in a very aspirational way and they trailblaze and they are really ambitious in their thinking. But sometimes they don't just check that everybody is following them. They don't check enough that people are on the same journey with them and are catching up and keeping up indeed. So building the engagement is the second lever I think that we have when we're thinking about this culture. In the top right hand corner, um, I talk about where the leader builds confidence. Um, and this is a really important gift that leaders have, which is how do you create confident schools, um, confident schools that, that take risks, but, but mitigate the, 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 the element of that. So it's not a dangerous risk, but it's a calculated gamble about something that we're going to do. That it create the culture where people are willing to take uh, innovative steps, to be ambitious and to incubate new ways of thinking. I think that's a really important skill that leaders have. And then the fourth building block is about impact. Uh, and, and I think the really important part here is that where I've just described to you the twin intelligences of operational and emotional intelligence and now talked about this cultural pyramid, all of those things contribute to impact. I think it's very difficult to go straight to the impact uh, uh, dimension without thinking about how we build the layers around it to structure it. So I hope that's a useful way into what I wanted to share with you this afternoon. On the next slide, um, I want to come back to that term ethical leadership that I've used um, and, and in many respects who could possibly disagree that being ethical in the way that we take leadership decisions is a good thing um, but I think it's quite helpful if we begin to explore what we think we mean by some of this um, and about three or three years ago now um, at Askell um, working in partnership with a number of other organizations set up an ethical leadership commission um, and the commission, when it published its findings and its report, talked about these virtues, um, and there are seven of them, uh, which I think are really interesting for when we think about how do we hold ourselves to account, but how do we develop and how do we improve others as well who, who want to, who are just starting out on their leadership journey, for example. So the first uh, virtue is trust, that leaders are trustworthy and reliable. The second is around wisdom, 
um, how leaders use their experience, knowledge and insight. I think wisdom is a brilliant word in this context, but we talk about what we've experienced and how do we deploy what we know in order to help other people get better. I think the third virtue is really underrated. It's about kindness, that respect, generosity of spirit, understanding and good temper. How do we, how do we demonstrate that we are kind in our leadership and our decision making? How do we deliver difficult feedback to people leaving them in a position where they want to come back and improve, not feeling absolutely torn apart by what we've said to them. The fourth virtue talks about justice and how leaders are fair and treat people equally. And then on the right hand side, service about being conscientious and dutiful, courage, which many, many of you have had to show as you set up your new schools, uh, often in the face of opposition where people have opposed the, your, the, the creation of your school. Um, but working courageously in the best interest of the young people that you serve. And then the last, but certainly not least, optimism, that leaders are positive and encouraging. And if you think about how we operate in those, I'm not going to be naive enough to say that when I was ahead or in, in your current situation, that on every day I exhibit all those virtues every single day, I, if that's not realistic. But this is the, these are the building blocks that build the leadership capacity of the individual to make the difference to the schools that they, that they, that they run. So let me take this a stage further on the next slide from modeling what I think that looks like in terms of individuals to how do we frame that in terms of how we lead our schools. Um, and and I, I like to share some questions as part of this. And these are questions which uh, I would encourage you to reflect upon uh, at your leisure or maybe even use them in your next team meeting to, to, to challenge the, the way in which we're, we're thinking today. And the first question is, what are the values that underpin the standards that you don't accept? So, you know, if we if we see behaviours that we don't uh, recognise as part of the way that we want to lead or something that feels very much out of character for the schools that we're, that we're leading, what are those values? Because it's absolutely important that we challenge the values and the behaviours when we see things that we don't accept. What should we never be willing to walk past? What, what, what do we ignore at our, at our peril? How do we enact and become the embodiment of our values? So, you know, for example, you know, when we talk in staff meetings or inset days or to assemblies or to parents about these values, do we live those values? Could people observe them in us? How do you help others to model ethical leadership and who models it for you? And then finally, how does your leadership raise the expectations in the communities that you, you serve? You cannot physically be everywhere but the spirit and the way in which you lead and the culture that you create goes home with a child every night when parents ask them what kind of a day they've had in school. So raising our expectations about the impact we can have on our communities, I think is a really powerful dimension to the way that we think about school leadership. And then the next slide talks about the standards that I think we should expect to see when we lead others. Um, and this, this can be really complicated, but I try to keep it very simple. So the first area I think is around behaviours and reacting to what we observe. And, and I think there are, as I've said, I've suggested here, there, there, there are four critical relationships um, that, that schools embody. First of all, is the way that adults behave towards children. The second is the way that adults behave towards each other. The third is the way that children behave towards each other and the way in which we build those relationships with parents. Um, and, and quite often in the work that I currently do for the Ambition Institute, um, I, I lead a programme called Trust Diagnostic, which is basically a, a review of multi-academy trusts, which, um, which they can commission from me and my team. And, and I, I always challenge myself that by the end of the day when I've been in, in the trust, not so much at the moment because of the pandemic, but certainly before COVID hit, when I was doing these fairly frequently, that I thought I could probably make a judgment about the culture of the school by observing the way that adults and children behave with each other. Uh, and, and I think that's an interesting way in which we, we see the exemplification of those standards. My second area is around inclusion and how do leaders build fairness and equity? So how do we keep an open mind and listen to people who've got different experiences to us? How do we avoid jumping to conclusions about what's right and what's wrong? Um, and how do we refuse to give up on any child or adult, uh, no matter how demanding their behaviours might be? The third area in the top right hand corner is around entitlement and what I call building equality. Because one of the things that we are, when we are agents of change, is we are also change agents of equality as well. And how do we make sure that every child who's in our care gets the access to quality teaching? How do we ensure that every adult gets an opportunity to be developed professionally and also to have their own well-being in the workplace taken account of? 
Um, and, and those are things which, again, are really easy to write down on a piece of paper and to talk about, but how do they really live and breathe in our schools? That's the interesting element of this. And then the final one in the bottom right-hand corner talks about supporting our educational community. And what I mean by that is, how do we not only learn from others, but how do we help others? How are we philanthropic in our, in our, in our social thinking? How do we help schools that, uh, that are in difficulty? How do we make sure that we work collectively with people to raise standards for the whole community and not just the one that we, the community that we serve? And then if I think one stage further on that on the next slide, so how do we do this? How does that work? How does that work? And how do we share that? How do we tell people about these things? And, and I think we do them because we describe them, we tell people about them, we build a narrative, we celebrate examples in assemblies, for example, when we see them being displayed. And we probably place praise ahead of sanction in the way that we build the culture of our school. But the question for me is, what is the risk of our values being obscured from those that we lead? So if people don't know me very well, because I'm a new head, or in your cases where you're building new year groups and new staff coming into your school because your schools are new, is how do you explain to people what's important to you and, and, and what drives you and the decisions that you, that you take, you face and you take? And I think on the right hand side, I've tried to think about the ways in which I think you do it. So your values come to the floor when you're appointing the floor, sorry, when you're appointing and promoting staff, when you performance manage staff. Some of you um, will, have, will have gained your headships um, very young in your careers and sometimes you're now managing people who were your peers or certainly entered the profession at the same stage as you. I call that the managing our mate syndrome um, and, and sometimes some of you will have people in your teams who are significantly more experienced in terms of the number of years that they've served in education. How do you manage more experienced staff? The way in which you get the, the balance right between those groups of people is really important. You see the actions about how you sanction children and how you praise them. Um, it's, it's, the, it's obviously really evident in the way that you respond to people who are upset, people who are angry, um, who want you to sort out all their problems for them, but you have to leave them feeling better about themselves and better about the future. And we definitely see it in the way that we think about how we create our strategic plans. So I think the way that we model that is on the next slide. Um, and I wanted to make a reference here to coaching and to mentoring. So um, I do quite a lot of this work with Matt CEOs. Uh, it's a major part of the work that I do for Ambition and, and outside of my work with Ambition. And I thought what I'd do with you was just to share the six questions that I use in the first few meetings I have with people. Um, not because we're necessarily going to answer them uh, this afternoon or, or this morning, but because I think they're good questions. Um, and you can read them, so I'm, I won't go through all of them uh, individually, but I want to pick out two uh, in particular. And the first one, I suppose, is number two on the list there, which is how challenging of your own performance do you want to be? And of course, the answer is nine times out of ten, very. Um, you know, I, I want to improve. I, I want to really explore how I get better. And that's great. That's a really positive answer. But what do we really mean by that question? Because I don't think it necessarily means about working harder or working faster. I think it's challenging the way that we embed what we believe in into the way that our schools are improving and that synergy between what we talk about and how we behave. I think that's what that question is getting at. I think there's something also about question six about do you behave differently when you're being observed in public as opposed to a more private setting. So if you were to come and watch me or I were to come and watch any of you deliver an assembly uh, or talk uh, at, a, at, a, at an open evening, for example, with, with, with parents, would I detect any difference between the messages that you communicate in those settings to how I know you as a coach and how you behave and the things that worry you and the things that give you anxiety? So use those questions maybe to, to think about your, your own team and the way that you can develop the culture of your team. But I think they're good questions for promoting the way that we think about that relationship between ethical leadership, culture and school improvements and school success. On the next slide, I just wanted to say a word about um, the, the the expectations that we raise in the communities that we serve, because people look at us and they look to us for guidance sometimes. And I think these are some of the things where, where I think leaders really come into uh, the strongest position. So leaders have to play the short term and the long term game. So you have to improve the school today and you also have to have a plan for the next two or three years. And so therefore we're thinking about what we need to improve in the next couple of days because we've seen something that we're not particularly comfortable with. We're also thinking about where that fits in the longer in the longer journey. We're talking about how we develop young people to become great citizens. Um, we're, we're, we're wanting 
young people to leave our schools, whether it's at the age of 11 or the age of 18, believing that education is the solution to their adult lives. That education when they leave school at 18 is just beginning, not coming to an end. And we start to paint the picture of what's possible. And through that point about the values of hope and optimism that I, I mentioned a moment ago, we begin to think about the transformational function that we have. And it's exhibited in things like we step up when another school is in trouble. We don't, we, don't, we don't celebrate the fact that another school in our community is finding life difficult. We get on the phone and we ask what we can do to help. And then we create a legacy that leaves our schools in a better position than we found the school in when we leave it, even if you set the school up from scratch, of course. But you leave that legacy because your school will be around uh, for many, many years after we move on. And that's such an important point of it. And then if I go back to my quote, the quote that underpins today, the standards you walk past are the standards you accept then what we start to see is where I think some of these things really begin to resonate. So um, I, I am absolutely clear that everything I've said to you so far today is about a really clear focus upon school improvement and how do you build your school improvement plans around some of the things I've said. And I think if you start it from the perspective of those multiple intelligences, you think about the cultural dimension and the behaviours and you think about the values and you have at the back of your mind this quote, the standards you walk past are the standards you accept you start to see some of these things happening. Um, so school improvement, as I've said at the beginning there, becomes sequential and progressive. It's not a, a knee-jerk reaction. It's not a quick fix. You're, you're planning systemic improvement over time. You're thinking about teacher development and the relationship between that and children's learning. You're thinking about the way the curriculum is relevant and challenging, but how enrichment as a part of that curriculum is promoting deeper learning. You're seeing relationships becoming more comfortable and more, and more successful and respectful, differences being celebrated. Um, inclusion, meaning people uh, are, are included and welcome, no matter what role they play in your school, from the most junior member of staff to the most senior, they are engaged and they feel involved in the, in the direction of travel that you're leading. Disagreements when they arise uh, can, can be resolved more quickly. And if we get all of those things right, our communities start to become, I think, more hopeful uh, and sustainable. And, and so let me pull that together before I finish off by talking about two questions that I think leaders have to be able to answer. Uh, and I phrase these on the next slide. Um, and, and I think this, this is really the crux of what we've been getting at today. What are the standards that you would never walk past? The standards that you would completely never ignore, that you would engage with and you would intervene with, if accepting them meant your team had to choose between you and their own personal values? How do you ensure that the team around you, and I mean the team in the wider sense, not just your leadership team, but people working for you in your school, how do you give them the opportunity to, to demonstrate their commitment, their values to the direction of travel that you're leading? And the second question is, what standards that you would never walk past if accepting those lower standards meant that children remain disadvantaged? Um, they're both, I think, fairly straightforward questions to answer, but I think they're really good ones to remind ourselves about the things that are so important to the way that we lead. And I want to finish and move towards the conclusion of the, of the presentation by talking about collaboration, because I've made several reference points to that uh, in, 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 in these slides. And collaboration really interests me because I think it's a very powerful tool for school improvement. I think it's a really important element of what we do in educational leadership. But I think there's a caveat for me around that, which is that if we don't plan it and make it purposeful, it can become a real time and energy trap. And when I was working in the Department for Education as National Schools Commissioner, we talked a lot about collaboration. Um, and on the back of those discussions, I, I designed these five tests to, to try to assess, usually in multi-academy trust, but also in teaching school alliances as well, whether or not collaboration stood a chance of being really successful. And the first test is really about purpose, uh, and it's about being very clear about the goals and the priorities and what the intended outcome is of the collaboration. Why is it that we're going to invest this time and energy in, in this pursuit? What is it we're trying to resolve? The second test is around mutuality, um, by which I mean that when you've got two schools working together or two teams working together, it's extremely unlikely that there won't be mutual learning between the two. Even if one of the partners is, is clearly at the moment in a stronger position and has a, a more successful track record, it is not true to say that both partners cannot learn from each other. That's what the mutuality means. The third test is around change. Um, and, and to be blunt, what I mean here is if people enter a collaboration 
hoping that all it will do is prove that what they're doing is right and that there will be no need to change anything, then the chances are collaboration will fail. So, so the, the likelihood that change will happen as a product of collaboration is a really important test. The fourth one is around pace, and I could easily use the word momentum here. One of the reasons why collaborations fade out is that people just get tired with it because nothing's happening. It's repetitious. It's a talking shop. So having an element of pace and probably having an end point where you agree that the collaboration will have delivered what it was set up to do. And at that point, you review whether it continues, takes a new shape or direction is an important part of it. And the final test is around prioritization, which again, I can sum up simply by saying, if you're going to engage in this collaboration, what are you going to stop doing to create the capacity and the time and the space to do this new piece of work? Because if you don't think in those terms, then what tends to happen is we stockpile those initiatives and we stockpile the workload as well. And so those five tests, I think are really interesting. And if I then turn the coin back on the schools in the next slide, my question here is what contributions do schools make to collaboration? And I think there are three. I think you always need to have a school or a group of people who are leading that collaboration, not because they're necessarily the best, but the timing is right. They've got the track record, they've got the capacity, they've got the experience. So we need some people in a collaborative pursuit to absolutely lead this and be accountable for what, what happens. The second contribution is to participate. So these are schools that could lead or maybe not, but they are absolutely committed to participating. Uh, and and when I, by participating, I mean they are willing to give time to it. They might even donate financial resource to it or expertise to it, but they are going to be really hungry to find out how this participation can improve the standards in their school. And then the final contribution is about endorsing. Uh, and, and schools in this category, for whatever reason, they don't lead it, nor do they participate. It may well be it's not appropriate at this moment for them to do so, but they are really curious about what you do. They want to find out the evidence. They want to find out the outcome of what you did. Not only they can learn from it, but when they then agree to participate or lead in the future, they do so understanding how that collaborative pursuit has worked. So I thought it was important when we're talking about the role of leadership, particularly in the way that the landscape is changing and more and more of us are working in collaborations to touch on that and to think very briefly about that. And then I want to finish with two personal reflections. Um, the first one really is about what I've called my personal leadership lessons from the past 20 years. So I entered teaching in 1983. I was a music teacher for a number of years. Um, and I took on my, my first headship in 1997. So from that point onwards, through headship, executive headship, running my own trust in Bristol and the commissioner roles that you heard Hannah talk about at the beginning, I've been leading in schools for a considerable amount of time. And these are some of the things that I think, I hope I remember and I reflect upon. Um, the first one is about, it's okay to change your mind, but I think it's not okay to compromise your values and beliefs. Because for me, that's the foundation. That's what everything else is built upon. So we can think differently about things. We can persuade you that there are better ways to do things. But underneath all of that is the values and beliefs that we are passionate about. Maya Angelou has this wonderful quote, which, 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 uh, which I've used a lot. She says, people forget what you said, what you did, but never how you made them feel. Um, and when we have so many conversations um, in formal settings, in formal settings, in the corridor, in the staff room, on break duty, uh, it's really important that we remember that, that we don't dismiss somebody with a quick, um, a quick comment or a quick phrase that actually makes them wondering what you meant uh, about that. The third point is my point I've made earlier about improvement is not a quick fix. It's about finding the right strategy and sticking with it and making sure that the, the results that you want, the outcomes you want, catch up with that strategy. I think I've learned over the years that aggressive behaviour, whilst it's difficult and challenging from children and from adults at times, is often a cry for help rather than a desire to inflict damage, which sometimes is hard to remember when someone's being aggressive towards you. But I think you have to understand where that behaviour comes from. And, and that's where our values and our core beliefs come, in, come into effect. And then finally, I've talked here about legacy matters. How do we build teams? How do we develop people and leave our schools in a better state for our successors? And I just want to sum that up, if I can, on the final slide with reference to um, James Kerr's book, Legacy, which I'm sure some of you will be very familiar with. Um, and for me, it was a very enlightening moment when I read that book. It's a book about the All Blacks rugby team, the New Zealand rugby team. So, it, so it's lessons in leadership through the lens of the All Blacks team. But they talk in the book about the way that when a new player 
uh, is awarded their first international cap for the All Blacks, how the jersey is presented to them the night before the game. Um, and they talk about the people who've worn that shirt before, the number that they're going to wear the following day. And that actually that shirt will never belong to them, but they've got to look after it and treat it with integrity while they're wearing it. And I, I thought that resonated for me. And it reminded me that the schools that I've been involved in uh, over the, over the 30 odd years I've been in education never belonged to me um, and that the communities um, that surrounded those schools needed that school to be strong for many years after I left them and that I was really just passing through and that my responsibility as a leader was to leave my footprint on that school in such a way that the legacy challenge about how my schools got better as a result of my involvement but the people came in after me and made them even stronger again so how do we hand over our schools to our successors in a better state than when we were, we, we took them on ourselves and that's why those bullet points here about what this means for young people are really important around how we how we achieve that so legacy feels to me to be a very fitting note um, to to end a session that's described about the importance of leadership so I wish you well in all the work that you're doing and thank you very much for listening and I hope that was useful.